Okay, let's get started. Okay, so we're going to start today with our grade 12 curriculum, and we're going to go through DNA and the uh, history of discovery of DNA for today's lesson. Let me share my screen. So I'm just trying to see which is the correct one. So all windows. I'm not, ah, oh, there we are. Okay. Okay, DNA, the code of life. So first things first, we're going to go back to grade 10 and just recap on um, the nucleus structure because it's so essential for how DNA works. If we take a look at a nucleus, we have a nuclear membrane on the outside. This is a double membrane, and that's very important that you know it's a double membrane. It's got small little gaps inside it, and that's going to be very important in terms of protein synthesis because RNA will come in and out of those nuclear pores. RNA can be able to move out of the DNA, mRNA specifically, messenger RNA, will be able to move out of the nucleus and into the nucleus the whole time. But DNA is trapped inside here. DNA is too big and cannot leave through the nuclear pores. So it stays inside the nucleus. That's why we're going to need mRNA to be able to go in and out of the nucleus the whole time to carry the message that the DNA contains to the other parts of the cell. On the inside of your um, nucleus, you have a chromatin material. And the chromatin material is specifically, um, there's some threads that come out um, and then it's compressed in the area that we call the nucleolus. Now see the nucleolus as a file cabinet. And this analogy is going to be very useful later when we go into um, how the DNA works. So it's a filing cabinet. And if you, if you think about a filing cabinet, I'm just gonna draw uh, one over here. Um, if you have a filing cabinet, what will happen is you will open one of these drawers. When you open one of these drawers, then what will happen, and this is the view from the side, you can pull out a file. And if you pull out a file, you can then use that file. Now, what is this file containing? This file contains building plans. And the building plans are for proteins. Is going to tell me how to produce my proteins. And that's what DNA is. DNA is a building plan uh, for how to build proteins. So we talked about the fact that it's a filing cabinet. And when the threads are going out of this filing cabinet over here, it's when the files are being read. But the files don't ever leave the office. They never leave the nucleolus. They stay inside the nucleolus. And so the, the, um, uh, the nucleus, sorry. Um, and so mRNA, which is the messenger, is going, messenger RNA is going to read the code from the files and take the message to the cytoplasm and to the ribosome where proteins are going to be made. Okay, so um, I've changed my strategy a little bit when I set up the presentations for the grade 12. So in each and every lesson, what we do, the second slide of every lesson tells us what CAPS wants us to know for that lesson. And so anything that's not contained in CAPS, they are not allowed to ask you. So what does CAPS need us to know for this specific lesson? They need us to know, we need, must do the revision of the structure of the cell with the emphasis on ribosomes, cytoplasm, and the parts of the nucleus. We've done this now. We've done the parts of the nucleus. Nucleic acids consist out of nucleotides, so we must know about the nucleotides. And there's two types of nucleotides. 
there's DNA and RNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid and ribose nucleic acid. Okay, so just to recap, the nucleolus consists out of a double membrane, the nuclear membrane around it, the nucleus. It's got pores, which is going to have RNA coming in and out of it the whole time and connecting the nucleoplasm, but basically cytoplasm inside the nucleus with the rest of the cytoplasm inside the cell. The nucleoplasm is jelly like liquid that surrounds the nuclear membrane and is surrounded by the nuclear membrane. A small round nucleolus is floating in the nucleoplasm containing the DNA or chromatin material with the DNA inside it. And the chromatin network, a mass of thread like structures, also floats inside the nucleus. And this consists out of a long string of DNA. chromatin network. So when the cell divides, the chromatin network coils up and thickens into separate sorts of structures that are called chromosomes. So basically your nucleolus, they're telling you your nucleolus and the threads, the chromatin network, they, uh, when we reproduce the DNA, they actually wind up to form structures called chromosomes. That looks like this. And this one nucleolus will form several chromosomes. In the case of humans, they form 46 pairs of chromosomes. Or, uh, sorry, not 46 pairs, 23 pairs of chromosomes, which is 46. But basically this and this, this can form this when the nucleus, uh, when we want to divide the cell. And both of these things consist out of long strings of what we call DNA. And DNA contains the genetic material of the cell. The nucleus controls the structure and metabolism of the cell by determining uh, what proteins are going to be produced in the cell. And by producing these proteins, we're not just talking about structural proteins, I'm talking about things like enzymes, which speeds up chemical reactions inside of the Sorry about that. Let me just scroll back. Okay, so <clears throat> let's take a look at DNA and RNA and the differences between the two. So uh, they both consist out of nucleic acids. Uh, when you take a look at um, the different types of organic molecules, you get uh, basically starches or sugars or carbohydrates. And then you get fats and lipids. Then you get proteins. And finally, you get nucleic acids. Those are your main um, macro organic molecules. Okay, now, a nucleic acid consists actually out of different parts. It consists out of a fat part and a sugar part and a little bit of protein. When we take a look at DNA and RNA, um, notice the name deoxyribose, deoxy. Deoxy means that there's one oxygen inside ribonucleic acid that is not inside DNA, deoxyribose. Deoxy means without that oxygen. Okay, and so that's one difference. The second difference is that you can see here, DNA consists out of um, two sides. It's got two sides, while RNA only consists out of one side. These, both of these spiral up, and so what we talk about when we say DNA, we say it forms a double helix, and we're going to talk about the double helix in a little bit more detail when we do DNA discovery in a, in a moment. Okay, uh, but RNA is a single strand, a single strand. Okay, so that's one major difference. Is a double strand, this is a single strand, okay, for RNA. Okay, so deoxyribose nucleic acid, we find mainly inside the nucleus. Uh, please, there's a trick question to this, because there's also some 
DNA inside the mitochondrion. We call it mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial DNA. So there are some DNAs inside the mitochondria. And the simple reason for this is the mitochondria is a very big organelle. And so what we find with um, the mitochondria is that it needs its own DNA. And that mitochondrial DNA is very important in terms of later this, uh, later uh, when we do human evolution, we use mitochondrial DNA to motivate what we call the out of Africa hypothesis. Okay, so mitochondrial DNA, and but we're, we're going to focus on nuclear DNA for this section. Some DNA is mitochondrion, in, um, and also we find inside chloroplasts, inside plants, we find also some DNA. Um, forms of chromatin network of chromosomes, DNA wraps themselves around proteins called histones to form long thin threads and chromosomes. We will go through that in more detail when we do DNA replication, sorry, replication, which is actually just the way the DNA reproduces itself or makes copies of itself. Okay, so what are genes? Um, if we take a long string of DNA and we cut it in certain places, that section might code for a specific protein. And so when it codes for a specific protein, that specific section of DNA we call a gene. Now, what's quite unique, if we take a look at DNA, 90, 95 percent of DNA does not code for anything. But in between these, there's sections that code for genes and so um, that code for specific proteins, and those are called genes. So what is a DNA? It's a short section of DNA that codes for a specific protein. Please know the definition of a gene. And of course, by coding for a specific protein, protein determines the structure and functioning of the cell. And so that is, uh, and because proteins are determined by the DNA structure, in the end, the DNA is the one that is in charge. Chromosomes can only be seen when the cell divides. So normally we don't see chromosomes, but you can see here the nucleus turns into these chromosomes, but we can only see the chromosomes when we're going into the vision. What are we talking about the vision? You did it in grade 10, we're talking about mitosis, but this year or in this section of work, we'll also talk about meiosis. Okay. Now I'm going to skip the sections that you have to do, um, and let's go on to the history of DNA. Let me just go and have a new share over here. Okay, so how was DNA discovered? So this section normally ends up inside of your um, short questions. So that's important for your short question section. So what do we need to know for the section with regards to caps? We need to know where is DNA found? Where is DNA found? We already told you. It's found inside the nucleus. There's also some um, inside the mitochondrion, also some inside the chloroplast, but we mainly focus on the DNA inside the nucleus. Then, uh, there's a brief history of the discovery of structure of the DNA molecule. You need to know about Watson, Crick, Franklin, and Wilkins. And normally they have, they mix up these names and ask you short questions in the, um, short questions in the multiple choice questions, where they mix up these names. And you need to read your questions very carefully in terms of that. Um, and we'll explain the whole story in a moment. Three components of DNA include, what are the three components of DNA? There's a nitrogenous base, a protein part, uh, linked with weak hydrogen bonds. There's four nitrogenous bases. We're going to call them for short, A, T, C, and G. The long names are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Then the pairing bases normally, okay, then A normally bonds to T and C to G. So there's base pairing happening. We call it base pairing that's going to happen. And this is going to be important, and you're going to see it happening in protein synthesis. You're also going to see it happening in DNA replication. 
that, pro, that base pairing where A connects to T or T connects to A and C connects to D and D connects to C is the way that we maintain the DNA code and still be able to copy it and read it. Okay, there's also a sugar portion to the DNA, it's a deoxyribose sugar, and there's a phosphate section, which is uh, basically a fatty section to the DNA molecule. Okay, now, from there, we need to know that the natural shape of the DNA is a double helix, and we must be able to draw a stick diagram of the DNA molecule and illustrate it and label it. We must know the functions of the DNA. We must know the sections of DNA forming genes carry hereditary information. That means genetic information that's passed on from one generation to the next or from one cell to the next. And the DNA contains coded information to be able to form what? I already told you previously to form proteins. Okay, so discovery of DNA. Um, DNA, the first structure of DNA was hypothesized by James Watson and Francis Crick. And they proposed that the DNA consists out of a double helix and they did this in 1953. So it's actually, in terms of genetic studies, it's actually quite a recent discovery. Various scientists paved the way to make this possible, and there's a very interesting story around this. So let's go through some of these scientists. This is Greg Mendel, and you're going to learn a bit more later, um, uh, later this year about him. We're going to do what we call Mendelian genetics. This is because of his surname, Greg Mendel. Mendel. Okay, so he was a um, he was a monk, um, and he had more time on his hands than anything. So he got bored and he started experimenting with some pea plants inside of uh, the monastery garden. And he did these several pea plant experiments and he discovered that um, certain characteristics are passed on from one generation to the next. And so he said, that these characteristics are controlled by what he called genes. Then in 1874, uh, Frederick Menser, and you don't need to know his name, um, it's never asked, he identifies DNA as genes. Then in 1920, science would believe that genes consist of proteins, so there was consensus about that. But later they discovered, no, it's not just protein. So Frederick Griffith, who you don't need to know his name or remember his name, in 1928 states that DNA does not consist out of proteins. There's more parts to that than just proteins. And then in 1944, you, uh, there's again another um, person that you don't need to remember for your test purposes, Oswald Avery. He supports Griffiths that DNA is the hereditary molecule, is the gene molecule. In 1941 and 9, Erwin Chagas uh, determines that there's equal amounts of adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. So you don't need to remember Erwin, but you need to remember that adenine and thymine is always equal amounts inside the DNA and guanine and cytosine is always because that is where we get to base bearing. Base pairing. That's how it ends up to be the same amount of adenine and thymine each time in a DNA and guanine and cytosine inside the DNA. This later helps Francis and Crick theorize that it's a double helix and base pairing um, ha is happening because initially they thought it was actually a triple helix. But if you take it a triple helix, then you can't have that base pairing. Now here comes the interesting part, and these names you do need remember. Rosalind Franklin takes an x-ray photo of DNA that looks like that. That's her photo. And the photo suggests that DNA is actually that of a helix, the shape of a helix. And that's extremely important in the way that DNA works, the fact that it winds itself up into a helix. And so, um, but they weren't sure. 
Is this a double or triple helix? She doesn't know. And then her professor, the person in charge of her, Maurice Wilkins, goes and does something that is not maybe so morally right. He shows what's an encrypted DNA photos. And that's fine, but it was Rosalind Franklin that should have shown them that. And they then realized, oh, but it's a helix. And then they go and they formulate that it's a double helix that makes up DNA. Okay, and that was in 1953. Then, um, in 1962, about oh, nine years later, uh, they Watson Creek and Wilkins received the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine, but Rosalind Franklin does not, which is sad because this um, the the Nobel Prize is not handed out personally. And Rosalind Franklin died in 1958 of cancer, and uh, which is very sad because she died very young of cancer at age 37. And it's probably because she was working with x-rays the whole time, and people didn't realize that cancer can be treated with x-rays at that stage. Okay. Uh, then very much later on, about 30 years later on, uh, we start the Human Genome Project, and James Watson directs the Human Genome Project. And 30 years later, the whole human genome was mapped. So we can actually go and take a look at the whole DNA code of humans, uh, or basic the basic human DNA code of humans, uh, with all its letters of A, T, S, T, and G that repeat one another in a certain And most of our DNA is actually about the same between, between humans. Okay, so what's the structure of DNA? It's a giant molecule, it's twisted into a double strand. Uh, if you wind it down, it forms a little ladder um, and almost two meters long, yeah, but it's coiled up so it can fit inside the cell. So that's very long for a small molecule like that, or for a thin molecule like that. And then, uh, the fact that it can fit into the cell is just, and even just not just into the cell, but into the nucleus of the cell is just amazing. It's a polymer, which means it consists out of uh, various repeating parts, consisting out of nucleotide, nucleotides, monomers, monomers. Okay, so each monomer consists out of a sugar part, there's your sugar part, and it's a pinto sugar, one, two, three, four, five, pinto stands for five pinto, five pinto sugar, five corner sugar, it's got a phosphate side and it's got a nitrogenous base, which is either adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And in the case of RNA, it is replaced with uracil. Uh, thymine is replaced with uracil. Okay. Um, now, very important as well, the nitrogenous bases. Adenine and guanine are larger. We call them purine bases. And cytosine and thymine are smaller. We call them pyrimidine bases. And of course, cytosine connects to guanine, and guanine to cytosine, adenine connects to thymine, and thymine connects to adenine. These bases. So you've got a short molecule connecting with a longer molecule. Okay, so nucleotide, the deoxyribose combines with the phosphate group, um, and the nitrogenous base combines with the deoxyribose, and that determines the nitrogenous base determines whether it's adenine, guanine, thymine, or cytosine. These two link up this way. They, this one links up to that one to form long chains, which makes, of course, the sides of the ladder. Okay, so there we see the sides of the ladder with the phosphates and the sugars binding up. We call it the uh, sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA, sugar phosphate backbone. And in the middle, you find these nucleotides, cytosine always bonding to guanine, or guanine always bonding to cytosine, adenine always bonding to thymine, and thymine always connecting to adenine. Okay, so A to T, T to A, C to G, D to C. Doesn't combine any other way. That's why we always have uh, the very same amount of cytosine and guanine, and the same amount of thymine and adenine inside our DNA. So we each time have a purine, connecting with a pyrimidine. 
Okay, how do they base there? They base there with hydrogen bonds. Uh, between cytosine and guanine, or guanine and cytosine, there's always three hydrogen bonds. And between thymine and adenine, or adenine and thymine, there's always two hydrogen bonds. Okay, so nucleotides are repeated many times. Uh, they form a code like C, G, D, D, C, A, A, T, T. Now, I'm just saying random, but, but basically that forms your code your nucleotide sequence forms your code for your DNA. And so uh, base pairing compares, as all you know already, and that's how it forms, just like um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G forms words, the A's and the C's and the G's and the T's inside your DNA forms a specific code which codes for a specific protein. And what we do when we read the code is we read nucleotides at a time so this could be ACT and the next three could be GGT and that is going to code for a specific amino acid in my protein molecule that eventually forms so what's the role of DNA they, they it carries genetic code um, for making proteins uh, and remember, proteins form all structures inside your body and also determines the, the um, chemical reactions that happen inside your body because enzymes are proteins. A gene is a short section of DNA that codes for a specific nitrogenous base, and then uh, the sequence of nitrogenous bases then determines the sequence of amino acid that combines to form a protein. We'll do this in a bit more detail when we go into protein synthesis. Okay, DNA replicates to make a copy of itself to transfer the genetic code to new cells. There's also a very large portion of DNA that doesn't code for anything. We call it non-coding DNA, um, which is only about 2% of DNA actually codes for proteins. The rest is, we call, they used to call it junk DNA, but there's, there are some functions behind the DNA, so we don't call it junk DNA anymore. The rest of the DNA is not currently previously called junk DNA, now found to assist the controlling of expression of genes in coding DNA and protects uh, proteins, uh, protects against mutations as well, which we're going to talk also about in this section later. It controls copying of genes during transcription and in protein synthesis. Okay. People, that is our lesson for today. Now, I know it's much to take in, so what I need you to do is to go onto the grade 12 classroom. Uh, let me go onto my grade 12 classroom here. Where's my. Go onto my grade 12 classroom. I did post uh, the link. And just go through lesson one and two and do the videos for lesson one and two and watch those videos as well. And that's all for it today. Do I have any questions before we log off? I'm just checking in the chat as well if there's any questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Chepo. So for our final exam, we have to know um, under population economy, there's, there's, a, there's a point where I think we're teaching something like graphs. Some like yes. bar graphs to support the birth rate, death rate. We have to know those. Yes, you have to know that. Yes, okay. you have to. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Uh, Latov is asking, are there plenty types of proteins? There's plenty types of proteins but there's only about 23 types of amino acids. And you'll see that later. There's about 23 amino acids, different amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And so 23 amino acids, but you can think there's 26 letters and you can make up many words with those letters. So if you have 23 different proteins, you can make up many different proteins with those amino acids. And you can make up very, uh, if you take a look at proteins, they consist out of very long chains of amino acids. Some um, proteins consist, uh, I mean, even small proteins are at least 50 or so amino acids long. 
you can get um, proteins that are hundreds of amino acids long. So yes, uh, there's plenty types of proteins, but there's only about 23 types of amino acids which make up the proteins. Why do we have different types of proteins? Uh, we have different types of proteins because there's so many different things inside our body that needs to happen. So many different types of chemical reactions, um, all enzymes, all hormones are proteins. Uh, so different types of enzymes controlling different types of chemical reactions in your body. And you can just think in your body, the amount of chemical reactions happening inside your body will determine various different types of enzymes that need to control those chemical reactions. Then I'm not even talking about proteins inside your muscles um, and structural proteins inside of your cell membranes and all of those types of proteins. So um, proteins are basically one of the major building blocks of the body. And so that's why or of cells and of the body. Um, and so that's why we meet, need many different types of proteins. Okay, guys, I'm still at school and they're going to throw me out in a moment. Can I ask, is there any other questions before we log off, before they lock me in or throw me out of here? What happens when we have protein shortages? Okay, so they, that, that is a very important question, especially for those of you that are vegetarians. If you don't have enough amino acids in your body, uh, if you don't eat enough meat and get all of those proteins in, then you'll become, for example, anemic. Uh, which could be one of the problems, you'll become anemic, uh, which means that you won't have produced enough proteins for hemoglobin, and there's various other issues. Uh, your body will recycle some of the proteins, but as it recycles some of the proteins, it has to break down your muscle tissue to recycle it in another place. So you'll have very low muscle mass. Uh, where do we get amino acids? Uh, all proteins consist out of amino acids, and we get our amino acids by eating other by eating other animals um, and other protein sources like beans, legumes, uh, soya is another source of protein for us. But our main source of amino acid actually comes from meat, and it's important for us to eat meat. Um, Evolution-wise, it's important for us to eat meat because we actually designed to eat meat. So if you're vegetarian, I'm very, um, very unfortunate uh, because unfortunately I have to tell you that if we take a look at the structure of your body, it was designed to eat both plant and animal material, both meat, because that's where we get our proteins and our amino acids from. The top of very nice questions. Thank you very much. Okay, any more? Okay, guys, I will then see you tomorrow where we will continue with, I think it's uh, with DNA replication, which is normally a section that lands up into a lot of your practicals. Okay, thank you, and I will see you tomorrow.